Oh, overslept. Oh, hey everybody. Um, welcome to Rain Valley Church. This is so embarrassing. I hit the snooze button one too many times. Um, so glad you can join us though in church at home. Um, I guess one of the nice things about church these days is that my commute's a lot shorter. Um, whether you're watching us on live.rainvalley.church or you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube, uh, join in with us in the comments and why don't you let us know how many times you hit the snooze button in the morning when you wake up while I wake up my girls. Sunday morning, church, yay, we get to go to church. Church in our living room, yay, come on, babe. Okay, gotta wake up. Okay. Oh, today is a big day. It's Palm Sunday, and it may not feel like it because we're in our homes, but Jesus is no less worthy the praise that the masses gave him when he entered into Jerusalem. And uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna go brush my teeth now. So, uh, so while you've been at home, why don't you let us know? Much the longest that you've gone without brushing your teeth. <sighs> Almost ready. So, um, I don't know about you, but I'm a creature of habit and it's hard for me to start my day without a cup of coffee. So, just give me one more second. So we got our cereal, got our coffee, got all the essentials that we need for church in the morning. Um, and so let's let's do this. Hey guys, you guys ready for this? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's do this. All right, here we go. All right, so uh, from our family to yours, uh, we love you guys, and we are praying that God meets you in a special way this Palm Sunday. So would you pray with me as we begin church and home? Jesus, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for your ability to meet us wherever we're at. And as we remember the truths of Palm Sunday, as we, as we celebrate your triumphal entry and what you came to do for us, God, I pray that you'd meet our families in a special and a unique way in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, guys. Yeah, you forgot to change out of your sweat. Oh, <laughs> tell people that. Okay, en enjoy church. Good morning, church. Good morning. We're so excited to be able to be with you. We would much rather be with you in person, but I know my soul, my heart needs to just worship the Lord, to, to remember who He is, that He is good, that He is our hope, our salvation. Um, but we are definitely, definitely missing you. Uh, we can't, we long for the day to be gathered back together, but the Lord knows. He knows that we're, uh, what we're going through. He knows that we're in this time, kind of stuck in our homes, and He's, He's going to meet us even in this. And, uh, He's not distant. He's not far off. He is with us this morning. He sees us. And today we actually uh, are get, get to celebrate Palm Sunday. And uh, Palm Sunday is it's one of your favorite it is. holidays um, one of, um, in the church year. And it's a week before Jesus' death on the cross. And he rides into Jerusalem. It's called the Triumphal Entry of Jesus. And he allows people... Rachel was just reminding me of this. He, he allows people to worship him as king and as savior. And he really is. I mean, he is the Messiah coming to save. And um, he, he the people don't understand what that looks like, what that all means. They have a different idea, but he is definitely Messiah and savior. And they, they actually cry out to him. And this is from Matthew 21. They say this, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Uh, and so they're like shouting out as Jesus rides into Jerusalem. They're worshiping him uh, as, as their savior. And the word Hosanna is really, it's actually really appropriate for us and what we're going through right now. Because it's a cry of uh, faith. And it means God, savior, like save me, help us. Like I believe God that you can save me. So it's this like this hopeful uh, rejoicing cry that like the Savior has come. Hosanna, you're the God who can save us. And so 
uh, in this moment and just in this morning, like what we're going through, what we're in the midst of, it's good for us to start there and, and just remind ourselves that we can cry out to God in the same way. Put our hope in Him. Call on the Lord this morning. He is our hope, our salvation, and our life. Let's worship Him together. And feel free to wave your palm branches if you happen to have any. <laughs> <laughs> Within your name, this we know, this we know. You promise never to forsake. Will you begin? You will sustain. This we know. Shall I fear? The 
the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Just right now in the chat, even when you just write um, or tell those around you just like uh, why your hope is in the Lord this morning. You know, praise Him for being trustworthy, for being good, for being loving. You know, this ascribe to Him praise, thanksgiving. Let's just put it out there. Speak truth about our God to one another. Remind each other why our hope is in Him. Sing our hope. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into. Father, we just place 
our hope in you. We ask that you would meet us right where we're at this morning. Meet us with your presence, with your joy, God, with refreshment for our souls that's found only in you. And uh, just set us on a rock that's higher, God. Fill our hearts with your peace. Uh, Help us to see you for who you are as our salvation, as our hope, as our strength this morning. We put our trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. So happy to be with you on this Sunday morning. And thank you, worship team, so much for leading us in worship this morning. It's no secret right now that these are very challenging times. And so many of us have been affected by uh, what's going on right now. Our work has been affected. And certainly financially, so many of us are affected with what's been happening right now. And the church is not immune to this. Uh, The church has also been affected by this. And um, as my wife and I were prayerfully considering how we would be utilized by God uh, to possibly even give over and above what we uh, normally would or what we uh, would do on a regular basis, we were led to a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 that I'd like to share with you. It says this uh, at the end of verse 6. It says, Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In verse 10, he goes on to say, He who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all your generosity, which through us produce thanksgiving to God. As I was wrestling through and was challenged with how I may uh, help this church during this very difficult time, help our church during this very difficult time, I, I, I came to that and I thought, what an amazing privilege it is um, to be used by God, to have, be used as a vessel, to have finances and, and money pass through our hands to the Lord's work at our church. And because of that and through that, we're enriched in every way. And it produces thanksgiving to God as well. What you're going to see now on the screen is some different ways you can uh, give uh, and bless our church with uh, your offerings and your generosity. You'll see a way that you can text to give, uh, which is very convenient. You'll see uh, a way you can give online. Uh, Also, you can mail a check or money order to our church office. And you can utilize my personal favorite, which is uh, doing automatic bill pay, setting it up with your bank online, where you give automatically, uh, monthly, twice a month, or even weekly, uh, and it sends a a check to our church office automatically uh, on that frequency. Let me just pray for our offering now uh, for our church body. Father God, thank you so much that no matter what's going on out there, you are on the throne and you are in control. Lord, I pray for so many that are impacted financially by this current crisis, God. Lord, I pray for our church as we uh, uh, also have a financial burden at our church, that Lord, that you would open the storehouses and open your blessings in such a way and utilize us as churchgoers and church attenders at Moraine in such a way that would bring thanksgiving to you, God, as it says in your word. Give us an eternal perspective to always understand that all the finances in the world, all the money that we may have passed through our hands, it's all yours anyway, God. So as we give now, that we would be generous, not under compulsion, God, but because we are joyfully giving to your kingdom and your work. We lift up this time to you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Moraine Valley Church and our new online friends and those of you visiting with us today online. We're glad to have you with us. My guess is most of us have been on an airplane before, and right before we take off, they say, if our oxygen mask comes down, make sure you put yours on first before you help somebody else. You ever wonder why they say that? Well, the answer is simple. If you run out of oxygen yourself, you can't help somebody else with their oxygen. 
You know, and I've been tracking messages that have been coming out. I'm getting emails and podcasts and all kinds of things on what other leaders are saying in this time uh, to Christians regarding this crisis. And I see two categories of messages that are coming. One is comfort for the believer, and the other is challenge for the believer to go out and help others. I personally think they're both needed, but I think the comfort message has to precede the challenge message. And here's the reason why. If the Christian isn't secured with their own spiritual oxygen first, they won't have the oxygen available to help somebody else. And so my goal this morning is to give you another message for believers to help build you and strengthen you and comfort you and give you what you need during this season so you can have the spiritual oxygen you need so that you can be able to help others. You know, big things have been happening in this season of life and they're happening so fast with the changes that our God-given infrastructure that we've been made with is on overload. Recently, I listened to a seminar by Henry Cloud on the psychology of crisis, and he talked about our infrastructure. I want to mention three areas he said that are foundational to the way that God has made us to be. He talked about our connectedness with other people is very foundation. We were made to need one another. And in this season of social distancing, that whole thing of connectedness has been deeply shaken. People we normally depend upon and people we're normally with, we're not able to be with. Second of all, he talked about structure and order to our lives. And I don't take much to explain right now that the structure and the routines and the orders of our life have been thrown into chaos. Thirdly, he talked about the importance of our having a sense of control in our life. Obviously, there's things we can't control, but there's things we can control. And even today, many of the things we've been able to control have been deeply affected. So bottom line is, is when these things in our infrastructure have been deeply overloaded, there's a deep sense of uneasiness within us. Now you add to it this. Just for me personally, and I know other people have said the same, this last week the, rec the crisis has become much more personal and much more heavy. Let me explain what I mean. I now personally know more than one person that has the coronavirus. No longer is it just that thing out there. Now it's people I know. And one of them for a week has really been on the edge of life or death because of this. That has made this thing a whole new experience for me. There's others that need medical procedures that have to been put on hold because of the overload in the hospitals and their inability to help them. I know of three different people within our own church who've had loved ones or friends that have died and they've had to die alone at this time because of the new restrictions in the hospital and they aren't able to grieve as normal people would grieve because you can't even get groups together to do wakes and funerals. So they're feeling the depth of what's going on. You got others who have lost their jobs. Financial crisis has hit many families and people, and even our church is feeling the weight of the finances in this time, and people are saying, what am I going to do? How about the plans that have been thrown into flux? You had people that had weddings that were coming up during this time or very soon. You had anniversary parties. You had graduations. You had birthday parties. You had weddings and showers. I mean, the list goes on and on, and all that is thrown into chaos and flux, and they're not even sure what to do with those right now. Add to that parents that are home all day long with their kids that weren't there before, and many of them are at their wits' ends. And even husbands and wives that at the start of this thing thought, hey, this is pretty cool. It's kind of like a little couple-week honeymoon at home. Well, guess what? The honeymoon has ended for many. And we are finding the list goes on and on and on. This thing has become very personal 
and very heavy for most of us. If you've been around Moraine Valley Church for any length of time, you've heard me say this often, that life is bigger than we are strong and smarter than we are smart. Let me say it like this. When I'm saying things are bigger than we're strong, it means we can't fix it. No matter how much we try, we're not able to fix the situation. And when I say it's smarter than I am smart, it means I can't figure it out. No matter how hard I try, I can't get an answer to it. And that's what we find ourselves in right now. I'd like you to take a couple minutes. If you're by yourself, think this through yourself. If you're with somebody else watching this morning, what are two or three things right now that are bigger than you're strong or smarter than you're smart, something that you can't fix or figure out that you're facing right now? Secure that in your mind as we move forward this morning. And it'd be helpful to others if in the chat line you, you put those in to help them think about that. So we'll be back in a moment, but take a moment to uh, list those for yourself. There's a story in the scripture which tells us about a situation that Judah found themselves in that was bigger than they were strong and smarter than they were smart. It is found in the second book of Chronicles chapter 20. And it's the story of Jehoshaphat who was the king of Judah at that time. And he just found out that there were three nations that joined together, formed a massive army, and they were coming to attack him in Jerusalem, and they were just 25 miles away. Now listen to his response when we read it in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 3 and 4. Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. I love this interplay between verses 3 and 4 because it talks about Jehoshaphat turned his attention to seek the Lord. And then when they all came together, said they together to seek help from the Lord. Bottom line, they were seeking God for his help. And, as, and I, it talks about in verse 3, they turned his attention. Verse 4, they gathered together to seek the Lord. Bottom line is, is that they had set their heart to seek God. They turned their attention away from everything else that was going on to seek God's help in this time. 
They were intentional to set everything else aside to focus their sole attention to seek God for help through prayer. And then in verses 5 to 11, he tells us what this prayer is that Jehoshaphat led the people in. I love where he starts in verse 6. And he says this, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. I love where Jehoshaphat began his prayer. He was exalting God for the fact that he's in control and that he's so powerful that nobody can stand against his power. Isn't that the place where we should be starting when we find ourselves in situations that are bigger than we're strong and smarter than we're smart? To get into the presence of God and before we bring our requests, we're orienting ourselves in the presence of God and staying there until we see a God who is bigger than the thing that is bigger than us and a God who's smarter than the thing that is smarter than us. And so I love the way Jehoshaphat begins this and the way we should begin in every crisis as we pull away from everything else we're doing. We go into the presence of God and we reorient ourselves to who we're speaking to while this situation may be bigger and smarter than I am. We have a God who's bigger and smarter than the situation. And that's where he starts his prayer. Then he continues in the prayer and reminds God of two things. First of all, God is the one that gave him this land that these guys are trying to come and take. And second of all, he reminds God of his promise that if they would turn to him in prayer at the temple in times of trouble, that he would hear their prayer and deliver them. And the Bible is loaded with promises for you and me that if we would go to God in prayer, that he would hear us and that he would deliver us. And so we go through that and then we come to verse 12 and we see the request that gives us some insight into what we need to do in times like this. He starts off and says this in verse 12. Here's his request. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude are coming against us, nor do we know what to do. He admits, starting off, God, we're powerless before this great multitude that's coming against us. God, this is bigger than we're strong. We're powerless. We can't fix it. And then he says this, nor do we know what to do. God, this is smarter than we're smart. We can't figure it out. And so here we've got Jehoshaphat in a situation that is bigger than he's strong and smarter than he's smart. And then he says this. And this really gives us insight into what we need in this time as we face our crisis. He said this. But our eyes are on you. God, I can't fix this thing. I can't figure it out, but my eyes are locked in to you. The eyes of my heart are locked on to you. I'm leaning on you, Lord. I'm trusting in you. This is the request that Jehoshaphat brought before the Lord as he admitted his powerlessness and declared that his faith and his trust was solely in the Lord. And when we find ourselves in times like this, that's what we need to do. We need to lock in on the Lord. Our trust needs to be in him. We need to stop trying to figure it out. We need to stop trying to fix it. And we need to get before God, recognize he's bigger than this thing, admit we can't do it. And God, I'm just trusting you. Not even telling God what to do, but just saying, Lord, my trust is in you. And that's what Jehoshaphat did in this time. 
Reminds me a lot of Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, a passage that many of us know. Let me read it to you. It says, the steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Uh, the English Standard Version says it this way. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. That's what, that's what Jehoshaphat was doing. Lord, my eyes are on you. My mind is stayed on you. Lord, I'm trusting you. The New Living Translation says it like this. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all those whose thoughts are fixed on you. This is what we need when we face crises that are bigger than we're strong and smarter than we're smart. We need to pull aside and give our attention to seek the Lord. We need to get into his presence and exalt him and worship and praise him and get a fresh view of the God who we're coming to, who's much bigger than the situation that we're facing. We need to admit to him that we are powerless, that, Lord, this thing is bigger than I am strong. Lord, I don't know what to do. It's smarter than I'm smart. And then declare that our dependence is in him and to trust him. And when you get done doing that, in the context of prayer, we need to keep our heart and our mind and our eyes locked on the Lord. It's not just something we declare in prayer. It's something we need to practice every moment of the day during this crisis. Lord, my eyes are locked on you. I declare it in prayer. Now I'm going to walk away from that time of prayer and I'm going to seek to keep my eyes locked on the Lord. Now, you need to know this. If you're going to do this, this is going to be a battle. This is going to be a spiritual battle because Satan is going to do everything he can to get your eyes off the Lord. Why? Because the Lord himself is the oxygen, the spiritual oxygen mass that we need to make it through a crisis. And as we're locked into him and depending on him and having our eyes on him, his spirit is giving us everything we need to walk through these times the way we do. So Satan's going to do everything he can to distract us from having our eyes on the Lord. I'm going to have my eyes on the Lord, and then all of a sudden this thought comes and I move over here and I find myself by this thought distracted. And then all of a sudden I got to pull myself back and say, no, Lord, I, I want to keep my eyes on you. And then all of a sudden I'm listening and, and I hear the news and all of a sudden my thoughts come over here and there's some new news today and more bad news about things that are happening here. And all of a sudden my thoughts are here and I got, and I got this battle where I got to pull back and say, no, Lord, you are bigger than this bad news. Then the phone rings, and it's somebody I know personally, and they're struck with the coronavirus, and now all of a sudden my thoughts are pulled over here again, and I'm all concerned about what's going on in this person's life that I love, and i got to be intentional to get my focus back on the Lord. One of the kids comes in the room and starts doing all kinds of craziness and screaming and crying and kicking their feet, and all of a sudden... My mind is set over here. And the list goes on and on. It, it, it'll be a, a doubt that comes in. You know, can God really do this? It'll be a temptation to come in. I'm just sick and tired of holding on to this stuff. I just need, I, I need not just a drink. I need a whole bunch of drinks to get through this time. It could be fear that's over controlling us. The point is this. There's going to be a battle point for us between keeping our mind stayed upon a God who is bigger than this thing and who's smarter than this thing and can minister to us in the midst of us. You see, Satan wants us to get our mind off the Lord and our heart off the Lord because when he does that, he's cut our attention away from a God who's bigger than this, a God who loves us, a God who's in control of the situation. So this is going to be our battle point as we walk through this. So bottom line, to keep our 
spiritual oxygen mask on during a crisis so we can help others, we need to keep our eyes locked upon the Lord. We need to admit to him our powerlessness, that I can't fix it. I don't know what to do. It's, it's smarter than I'm smart. I can't figure it out. And as we walk moment by moment relying upon him, he'll give us everything we need. This is a season where we need to be in vital communion with the Lord. We're going to need to be in his word. We're going to need to be praying. And I'm not just saying saying your prayers. We need to be talking to God. We need to be worshiping him. We need to be exalting him so that we're not cut off from the spiritual oxygen we need. We need to hear a word from God. We need God to work in our perspectives. We need God to enable us so we can fight the good fight of faith and keep our eyes locked on him during this time. We need to stay locked up on him and we need to do the spiritual disciplines that are important to get us there in this time because the Lord himself is the spiritual oxygen we need and we're connected to him and receiving from him We'll have the spiritual oxygen mask on us so that we can help others. Now, you may be with us today and you don't know Jesus. I want to say something to you in closing. Because Jesus is not only the Savior of our soul, he's the guardian and he's the shepherd of our souls. Matter of fact, what we find out that in the Old Testament, it talks about the good shepherd, God himself caring for his people. Well, in the New Testament, Jesus tells us he is that good shepherd. He is God. And he's a God who is bigger and smarter than the situation we're going through. And in John 10, he tells us that as the good shepherd, he has laid down his life for us so that we might have life and we might have an abundant life. Did you know coming into a relationship with God through Jesus is something that is bigger than we're strong and smarter than we're smart? It's not something we can fix, and it's not something we can figure out. Actually, coming into a relationship with God is something that Jesus has fixed for us. We can't fix for ourselves. And it's something that God has told us about in his word rather than us trying to figure it out. Listen to what the Bible says. In John 14, 6, Jesus said this, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one, no one comes to the Father but through me. The only way to God is through Jesus. Jesus is the truth about God, and he is the life that is being offered to us. And then in John 3, 16, Jesus said this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. As I said, being saved is bigger than we're strong. We can't fix it ourselves. Jesus did it when he died for us on the cross and he paid for our sins and he rose again from the dead to give us a brand new life. And it's something that's smarter than we're smart. We can't figure out, well, I'm just going to try to do it this way or do this to get right with God. God has told us the way. It's only through Jesus and it's only by believing in him. And so I want to encourage you this morning, if you've never put your trust in Jesus, would you come to him today and admit to him your sinfulness? Sin is simply meaning I have not lived my life the way that God has called me to live it. I haven't been able to live up to the perfect standard of righteousness that he calls us to. Admit that to God. And then come to him and admit to God that this is bigger than you can fix. There's nothing you can do to be able to fix your situation with God and declare before him that you're no longer going to trust yourself 
and you're transferring all your trust to Jesus Christ and what he did for you. And when you do that, at that moment, not only will your sins be forgiven, not only will you be given eternal life, but the Bible says the very spirit of Jesus, the spirit of the guardian and the shepherd of our souls will enter into your life and will walk with you and guide you through situations that are bigger than you're strong and smarter than you're smart. I want to exhort you this morning, turn to Jesus, put your trust in him. If you need informa more information about that, contact our church. We'll be glad to, somebody will call you personally on the phone and talk to you about your relationship with Jesus and help you enter into that. And as we turn to worship now, it's interesting the story I shared with you that as they stood there and they said, our eyes are locked on them, they stood there in the presence of the Lord just waiting upon him. And as they did, the Spirit of God came upon one of the Levites and he had a word from God saying, this battle is mine, I'm going to fight it for you. And when they went out the next day to battle, they put the worship team, the singers, out in front of the army. What a weird way to lead into war, but to go by means of praise and worship first. And God said, when they began to praise him, God set ambushes and defeated the enemies that came against Judah. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, this is a season to praise and worship God and watch what he does. Let me close this in prayer. Father, I want to thank you that you are bigger and smarter than anything we face. And Lord, I want to admit that we as people, uh, we got the best people in the world working on this coronavirus thing, and it's bigger than they're strong, and it's smarter than they're smart. And Lord, we come to you, and I ask you for mercy upon this world. I ask you for mercy upon us. God, I pray that you would remind your people that the way to walk in this time is to admit our powerlessness and that we don't know what to do, but to lock our eyes on you. Lord, would you give us the grace to do that? And anybody here today who's listening that doesn't know you, Lord, I pray your spirit would speak to them to cry out to you and to put their trust in Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. As we respond to God's word, uh, we're going to sing this song. It's kind of an older song. I'm not sure if you know it or not, but this song, man, it's been in my heart. I've been singing it all week long. I didn't even know uh, what um, that it was for the Sunday until uh, just a couple days ago when I talked to Pat and heard what God gave him for the Sunday. I was like, oh, this is the reason I've been dwelling on this song and... Uh, but let's look to the Lord, just in your own heart, in your own way. Feel free to sing with us, to pray, but just communicate to the Lord. Look to Him in faith.
Lord, we want to keep our eyes fixed on you. Now, we're going to do just that as we enter into Holy Week. Now, Holy Week, it's a time to reflect and slow down and quiet our hearts as we look back on the journey that Jesus took to the cross and his eventual death. But then we have Easter Sunday where we get to celebrate and we get to celebrate big. Now, to uh, do that together as a church, we're going to have a, a service on Good Friday at 7 p.m. Now, this is going to be unlike any other Good Friday service that we've ever had because we're not going to physically gather together in a physical space, but we're going to gather together online. Uh, and, and we're going to, like I said, reflect and look back on the journey that Jesus had to the cross. And to help us do that, to aid us in that time, we need you to grab four candles. Now, these candles are going to really help frame out the night for us and do something physical and, and tactile to just make it a little more real for us. Now, if you don't have four candles, that's okay. You can grab uh, maybe four lamps or four flashlights, or, or maybe you'll find yourself at the store this week and you can pick up four little tea lights. It doesn't need to be anything extravagant. Like I said, just something physical that will help us um, just make this a little bit more real. 
Now, the story doesn't end there. The story doesn't end on Friday. It ends on Sunday, the pinnacle and the apex of our faith. And that is the resurrection of Jesus. It is the point of the gospel. And we get to celebrate. And like I said, celebrate big. And I can't think of a a less intimidating opportunity to invite somebody to join us to, for church online for Easter Sunday to hear the good news of the gospel. And so I'm going to challenge you right now to, to do that. Find a family member or a friend who is far from God, doesn't know Jesus, but needs the hope of the gospel. Invite them. I mean, they get to attend church in their living room with people they're comfortable with and they know. Uh, they don't have to worry about maybe they have a, a history with the church where they just don't feel comfortable going to church anymore, or maybe they've never been to church and they just don't know what it's about. Uh, this is just a simple entry point for them. And you can invite them on Facebook by sharing our page or our YouTube channel. It's It really can't get any, uh, any less intimidating than this. Uh, so take that challenge, uh, invite somebody, invite a family member, invite a friend. Uh, we love you guys and We'll see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. for our daily devotion. We'll see you every morning at 9 a.m. for our daily devotionals. Um, But uh, let's enter into Holy Week where we start to quiet our hearts and reflect on the good news, the work of Jesus on the cross, and his resurrection, his love for us. We love you guys. We'll see you later.